If you haven't been here, we've been working our way through the book of Esther. And we are now into Esther 5. We've got a couple of more weeks leading into Christmas where we're going to wrap up Esther. Esther is a fabulous story. If you've not read the book of Esther, I would encourage you. Go back, read the book of Esther. It reads like, like a made-for-TV movie. This is a mini-series, a, a drama kind of thing that, that would be great. They've made movies out of it. And, and it's a really, really fascinating story. Uh, just really, really super quick backdrop. Uh, this is in Persia, so this is in the Middle East, kind of north of, of where Israel and a little bit to the east there of Israel, kind of over in what we know as the Fertile Crescent. Uh, the king that we're talking about is King Ahasuerus, but we don't know that name very well. The name that we know is King Xerxes. That's his Greek name. And so he's the ruler of all these lands at the time, the richest, most powerful, the most landed ruler in all of the history of the world up until that point. So he's kind of a big deal. And uh, he had gotten rid of one wife, kind of kicked out his queen, brought in another one, started up with a lady by the name of Esther. And uh, along the way, a bunch of things have happened, and we'll get into those details here as we go through the rest of the story today. But you need to know about Esther in particular. Esther is a woman who, who has two names in the book of Esther itself. Uh, the one name that she's known or referred to as is the name of Hadessa, and that's her Hebrew name. And then the name Esther is her Persian name. And throughout the book, it, at least up until this point, it seems as if she almost has a, a split or a dual identity, some sort of identity crisis going on, some sort of conflict internally in her life. Uh, who is she as, as we look at this? And, and is she a Hebrew girl or, or is she a Persian girl? We're not exactly sure at this point in the story. Is she going to be one of God's people or not one of God's people? Is her ultimate allegiance to her husband, King Xerxes, or, or is it to the King of Kings? the Lord of Lords, to Yahweh, God. And, and if she keeps on disobeying the Lord, she'll keep on having a comfortable life with her kingly husband. But if she starts obeying the Lord, her life could become very difficult. And perhaps, as we're seeing in this story, her life could be taken from her because of her faith. And so as I said, throughout this book, especially the early five chapters, it's almost as if uh, she has this dual identity. And maybe some of you can relate to that, right? Maybe sometimes you're Christian, but sometimes you're not so Christian, right? How many of you are like that? Sometimes you're holy, sometimes you're a little unholy. Uh, sometimes you're living for God, and sometimes you're hiding and running from God. Sometimes you're generous, sometimes you're greedy. Sometimes you're living for the glory of God, and sometimes you're simply living for your own convenience, right? So a lot of us can kind of relate to her dual identity. And what happens in the beginning here of chapter 5 is that through a series of circumstances, Esther is pressed to arrive at an identity. And the same thing happens for another character in the story, a man by the name of Haman. And, and we will see that they both respond differently. So we're going to start with Esther's identity in Esther 5, 1 through 8, if you're following along. You'll see on the screen, and there are Bibles in the pew, or in the, bullet, in the chairs in front of you, and we also have Bibles out on the Welcome Center. Version is a great app if you don't have a Bible app. And I'm going to be in Esther 5, 1 through 8 exclusively today, so feel free to follow along. And starting there in Esther 5, it says, On the third day, Esther, she put on her royal robes and stood in the inner courts of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne, inside the throne room, opposite the entrance to the palace. So according to the historical records, this is a magnificent throne room. This throne room had, had 36 pillars. Each pillar was 65 feet high, and that's a, a major accomplishment in that day without modern architecture. It was quite the feat. And, and, it, and it was in, this whole room was entirely designed that wherever you stood within that room, you would have basically an unobstructed view of the king's throne. This was all about the king. He wanted to focus on him. This guy certainly had an ego. And he was living and he wanted everyone else to live in his glory. And he sat there acting like he was some sort of little god. And this is the context in which Esther enters into that place. 
And then in verse 2 it says, And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor, or grace, in his sight. The story of Christianity is that, that, that Jesus is our king, and that we find favor or, or grace in his sight. And there's a little bit of an echo here uh, to how we come into that relationship with God. It says, she won favor in his sight, right? And then he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. And then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Now at this point, you need to know in the story that they've been married for five years. But they're not close to one another. We, we just read last week in chapter 4 that she had not seen him in 30 days her husband. And it wasn't because good old King Xerxes was off doing missionary work somewhere, right? Not, that, that's not what was happening. They lived in the palace together. She was living over in the, the women's quarters. He's over in the men's quarters. And no contact for over a month. And during this season, what had happened was Xerxes had empowered a man by the name of Haman to be a bit of his uh, right-hand man, so to speak. Kind of a, a vice president, if you will. And everyone bowed down before Haman, based upon Xerxes' decree. Everyone, that is, except for one guy. One lone guy would not bow down. One lone Jewish guy would not bow down. A man by the name of Mordecai. Now, if you don't know who Mordecai is, Mordecai is Esther's uncle and adoptive father. And he would not bow down to Haman. Every morning, Haman would go down to the gates with his little throne and sit on his throne and, and sit there because he thought he was a big deal too. And everybody would come before him. They would bow down and go about their business. Everyone but this one guy. Monday morning, he gets down there. Everybody bows down. There's one guy standing. What's up with that guy? Tuesday morning, everybody bows down. That one guy keeps standing. Why is that guy standing? Wednesday. What's up with this guy? Thursday. I am going to kill him because he won't bow down. And not only that, he decides he's going to assassinate, he's going to murder, he's going to commit genocide against all of that guy's people. The Jews are going to be put to death because of this conflict. You ever do something like this? You ever, you ever do something on purpose to drive somebody else crazy? That's kind of what Mordecai is doing here. Now, in my opinion, Mordecai could have bowed down, right? Uh, I, I've looked at it, and Mordecai was honestly, I think, being a little stubborn. It wouldn't have been that big of a deal for him to bow down. Uh, it's effectively, he was just supposed to be saluting the man in charge. It's like in the military, where you may not respect your commanding officer, but you will salute him, right? It's not an option. Yet, Mordecai decides to make his stand here. Now, because she's Persian royalty and of Jewish ancestry, Esther has come into a place where she is going to have an opportunity to be a mediator of sorts, to represent the people before the king. Kind of like Jesus does between, between God the Father and us. Him being both divine and human, Jesus is able to represent God to us and us to God. And Esther's in a position somewhat like that. She's Persian royalty, she's the queen, but she's of Jewish ancestry. So she's in a position to mediate this conflict and hopefully alleviate this death sentence that Haman has enacted against the Jews. But there's a problem. And here's the problem. The law of the land was that you can only enter into the king's presence if he invites you. So apparently Xerxes does not like interruptions. So he sits on his throne in this majestic palace, and if you come before him seeking the presence of the king uninvited, what he could do is he had the scepter, and he would extend it. And if he extended it and let you touch it, you were safe. If he didn't do that, off with the head. He had an axeman hanging out behind him, ready to go. So this is the 
kind of decision you don't just gamble on in life, right? You don't, you don't try to get a meeting with the king unless you're really, really, really needing to have a meeting with him. And you're fairly certain he's going to extend that scepter because you only get to make one mistake. And so what Esther says, knowing that this is the law and this is the situation, she says, if I perish, I perish. That's what she says at the end of chapter 4. She, like Jesus, is willing to die to save her people. Now here, here's what, what happens in the story. Esther goes and she gets dressed up in her royal robes. So, so she's respecting her husband. She's honoring her husband, the king. Even though, as we've learned in weeks past, he's not a man who's particularly honorable or a man who really deserves to be respected. But Esther's a wise woman. She's demonstrating great wisdom here. Much of this scene between her and Haman, as we continue on in Esther 5 and Esther 6, is almost an illustration of the big ideas that we find in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, if you don't know, is all about wisdom and folly. And Esther acts in a way that is very wise. And Haman acts in a way that is very foolish. And so the two of them are a comparison or a contrast of, of wisdom and folly for us. So as I said, she's acting very wisely. Now she's been fasting and she has asked Mordecai to get all the people of Susa who are Jews. Susa is the capital city. Get all of them together and fast for me for three days. And presumably pray, because praying goes with fasting. But she says, fast for me for three days. And after three days of fasting, I'm going to go to the king. And she knows the king cares an awful lot about appearances. In fact, the very reason he got rid of his, his very first wife is she wouldn't appear before him. She dishonored him in front of some others, kind of egg on the face, made him look bad. And so... Uh, he got rid of her. Nestor knows this. And so what she does is she dresses up in the royal robes. This is the respect that she's showing. She dresses up in these beautiful royal robes. And she knows that when she enters into the king's court, everyone in the room is going to be looking at her. Why, why, why is the queen here, right? She's not on the calendar. What's she doing? This is an unusual occurrence. Let's see how this goes, right? We know what happened to the last queen. She's gone. We weren't expecting this. She isn't invited. So you can imagine as Esther enters into the throne room, it's probably a little bit tense. But as the king, King Xerxes, looks at her, he sees a wife who's respectful towards him. And so he extends his scepter and she receives it. Now she's going to have this conversation with him in verse 3. It says, it says, And the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you, even to the half of my kingdom. Now, you need to know, this is one of those kind of turns of a phrase that were fairly common. He wasn't really expecting her to say, give me half of your kingdom, buddy. That's not, he's just, he's trying to portray himself as, you know, being Mr. Generosity. Uh, what do you need? Anything you need, just let me know. Half of my kingdom, whatever, you know, kind of, kind of thing. Flippantly, we might say, not literally meaning it. Like when we say you give the guy a shirt off of your back, you don't usually just take your shirt off and give it to him, right? But, but still kind of the same idea here with the king. And then Esther says in verse 4, if it pleases the king, let the king and Haman, you know, Haman, that guy who set the death sentence to murder millions of Jewish people that she is one of, but they don't know it at this point in the story because she's been concealing her identity. It hasn't been revealed yet. She says, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I will prepare for the king. That's a pretty nice request, right? Esther, you're here. What do you want? Right? Oh, darling, I would like to throw a magnificent dinner party for you, sweetie pie. And, and, and for you and your right-hand man, right? Now, how many of you are a little surprised that that's her request? There's millions of Jews with their lives hanging in the balance. What about all these people who are about to die? You're going to cook him nachos? 
or whatever. But she's able to maintain her composure. What she realizes in the moment is it's not yet time to tell the king to reverse the decision that Haman has issued. It's not yet time to save millions of Jews because that conversation would go something like this. Surprise, you married a Jew. Sorry, I haven't told you for the five years that we've been married. Whoops. (laughs) Right? There's a lot here that's complicated. And she is one of God's people. Can you imagine that conversation if she has it? She's like, I'm a Jew and I haven't told you. And eh, I think you're a false god. Do you like my new robe? Uh, how, How does that conversation go if she brings it up at this point? So rather than launching in with, hey buddy, I'm a Jew and he's Hitler and we're all going to die if you don't do something about it, she's wise about it. She's trying to rebuild the relationship that is at the very least strained with her husband. She's not seen him in a month, the Bible tells us. And it's very unlikely that he's been faithful to her during that time. So she's trying to earn his trust and keep an eye on Haman at the same time. A pretty wise plan. It's good when needed to do something, but to make sure that you're wise, that you're doing it with the the right motive, the right thing at the right time, or you could end up with the wrong result. And so Esther here exhibits great wisdom. And then it says, So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? And he's like, Certainly this can't be it. I mean, you risked your life just to cook me dinner? There must be more. So what is your wish, Esther? It shall be granted to you. What is your request, even if it's half of my kingdom? It shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, and she said, My wish and my request is, and you can imagine, they're like leaning forward, right? What is it she wants? If I have found favor in the sight of the king, if it pleases the king to grant my wish and to fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them tomorrow. And then I will do as the king has asked. Honey, what do you want? Let's all have dinner, right? Dinner comes. Honey, what do you want? Let's all have dinner again and then we'll talk. She's being loving and gracious and kind. She's demonstrating what Galatians calls the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. You see that? Now, this only works if you're a good cook, by the way. I doubt she served Ludafisk. It's Persia. They didn't have it. But we see here now that that Esther has come into her own and her faith. She's come into a a maturing relationship with God. She is now starting to take on to herself her own faith. She's beginning to think of others and not just of herself. She's become active and not just passive. She's, She's speaking now and she's not just silent. She's taking a risk. And taking a risk is faith. She's not cowering in terror, which is fear. And let me say this. What has happened for her is that she has received a new identity. She's no longer Hadessa and Esther, kind of with a split dual personality. This woman no longer has a conflicted identity. She's now and still a Persian princess. But that only explains her. It doesn't define her. And that is important to understand for your identity. You see, Esther's parents had died and she was an orphan. But that may explain her, but it doesn't define her. Mordecai has not been the greatest adoptive father. That might explain her, but it doesn't define her. She entered into this this, this dating competition that was really unholy. And that might explain her, but it doesn't define her. She was the queen of Persia. That might explain her, but it doesn't define her. Her identity has changed. She now knows that she belongs to God. And that's why in chapter 4, she asks the people to fast for her. 
so that within three days she would go before the king and try to save her people. It's interesting that it, it takes three days for salvation, isn't it? It's the very same number of days that Jesus was in the tomb. It took three days for his resurrection for our salvation. And it takes three days of them feasting, or not, uh, fasting and not feasting in the story. You see, the kingdom of God operates differently than the kingdom of this world. While the world is feasting, God's people are fasting, waiting the three days for Esther to enter into the presence of the king. And you see, our King Jesus is, is nothing like this. Our King Jesus welcomes us into his presence. The Bible calls his throne the throne of grace. So he's nothing at all like Xerxes. And we see in the story here, Esther's identity has changed. She's now one of God's people. You see, if your identity is changed, if your identity is not just simply just, I'm either one of God's people or not one of God's people, that changes everything for you. If you're not one of God's people, your identity is something that must be achieved. It's your beauty, it's your success, it's your income, it's your grade point average, it's your dating relationship, it's your marital status, it's maybe your athletic performance or your parental approval, it's what clothes you wear, it's what car you drive, it's, it's what house you live in, right? But if you're one of God's people, your identity is not achieved. It is received. You're loved. You're forgiven. You're cared for. You're blessed. You've found favor in the sight of God. You don't have to impress anyone. You don't have to do anything. You know what happens to a child when they're born? The parents love them. The child has not performed yet. The child hasn't accomplished yet. The child hasn't achieved anything. They don't work for their identity. They work from their identity. They're loved. They're cared for. They are part of the family. And so it is when we are born again in Jesus Christ. We receive a new identity. We don't live for our identity. That's the problem with the whole world. Uh, marketing, advertisement just pressures you to compete and to purchase so that you can produce some form of identity. We as Christians don't work for our identity. We work from our identity. If God loves us, and He does, then we can love others. We don't need to manipulate them to love us so that we can be loved. If God cares for us, and He does, well, that means that we don't so desperately need other people to be there for us. And when they fail us, we can then forgive them because we are still cared for by God. When we sin, that's not the end for us because God forgives sin. And He changes people. And in that, there is hope for us. You see how this works. The whole world lives for their identity. Only a Christ follower can live from their identity. And in this story, Esther's identity has changed. She has come to a point in faith where she can now say, If I perish, I perish. Meaning if I die, I die. <coughs> so let me ask you a question. What is your identity? Some of us have a conflicted identity, just like Esther had. It's Hadassah, or is it Esther? But she comes to a firm foundation of a new identity as someone who belongs to God, who is loved by God, has found favor in the sight of God. And in that it changes how she perceives herself and it changes how she lives her life. So who are you? Where does your identity come from? We all need to find our identity in Christ. And when we do that, 
our world changes, and in that, we can change the world. Folks, let's change the world. Amen? Let's pray.